My next guest is a UFC veteran who, whose gym, Westside MMA, is celebrating its 10th anniversary this week. The crazy Cuban, Roly Delgado, joins me here on the program for the very first time. Roly, how are you? I'm great, brother. How are you? Fantastic. And uh, thanks for asking. Not everyone asks how I'm doing, so I appreciate that. And uh, <laughs> before we uh, talk about your gym, uh, you know, most people remember you from uh, Season 8 of The Ultimate Fighter. Um, what was that experience like for you? Man, uh, honestly, I didn't enjoy the experience. Um, I was kind of at a different place in my life than I think uh, most people that are getting on the show are in. So I was kind of, I didn't really fit in that great with everybody. But uh, what it did for me was awesome. It created an opportunity for me to fight in the UFC three times, which led to me being able to fight belt or make a ton of connections that I still have. So uh, I'm like really glad I did it. I wish I would have done better. But uh, yeah, like the whole experience of like being stuck in a house for like six weeks with you know, a bunch of young, crazy dudes. Like, it's not really my personality, so it wasn't, it wasn't great in that respect. Yeah, I was going to say, and for, for most people, I don't think they could survive it, to be honest, not having TV, being stuck with a you know bunch of testosterone-filled guys and people not cleaning their dishes. Like, it's certainly not a great situation to be in. Uh, but I got to ask, is there anyone from that cast you still keep in touch with at all? Um, man, um, I've talked to Tom Lawler from time to time on Facebook. Um, Philippe Nova and I have crossed paths a few times. He's in New York, and I was uh, traveling up there for quite a bit. But um, other than that, I, man, I haven't talked to uh, really anybody from there in a really long time. Gotcha. Okay. Now, uh, you fought twice for the UFC and then competed uh, four more times outside the octagon going 3-1. Uh, and one. Uh, You haven't fought since 2012. Was that more because you wanted to focus on your gym, or was that just uh, injuries? What was sort of the reason for you uh, stepping away from the sport? It was uh, a combination of, uh, of injuries. And then just the fact that there just there just wasn't any money to be made, and I was kind of approaching a time in my life where I wanted to start making some money. So uh, with all my energy going into fighting, like my last fight, um, like I said, it was like a combination of both. I was in a cast for six months. I had my wrist um, worked on, and then I re did all the rehab. And then the very first round, I broke my uh, my hand. And then I was back in a cast, you know, and like I made like twenty five hundred bucks to fight. I had like seven hundred dollars in medical bills for the cast and stuff. And then uh, by the time I paid taxes on it and stuff, heck, I you know I lost money on the fight. And between that and being back in a cast, I kind of had to just look at it and go like, how hungry am I to keep doing this? And the desire wasn't the same as it was a couple of years ago. So. Um, aside from that last loss, I really feel like I retired well. I don't regret retiring. I don't really feel the urge to go back and um, really grind out a camp and do another fight. Um, and I tell people that the reason I'm able to do that is because once I got done with the Ultimate Fighter, and then like I knew I was going to fight in the finale, from that point, the three fights in the UFC and then four fights afterwards, you know, I trained to the best of my abilities. I gave 110%. And uh, so I did the best that I could. So I was able to retire well because I didn't have any regrets. And that's the best advice that I these guys, you know, because people that are real athletic, unlike myself, they don't necessarily do everything that they need to do. So then when they're like winding down, like they, they, they keep going back for more because they know they didn't give it 100 percent. But I did give it 100 percent. Now, now leading up to the Ultimate Fighter, I was just teaching jujitsu. I was I, I only like tried out for the heck of it and then I made it. And then, um, you know, I was a little behind the curve. But uh, then once I was fighting in the UFC and then trying to get back into the UFC, I did give it 110%, and so now I'm, you know, I did the best I could, and now I'm coaching jiu-jitsu, competing in jiu-jitsu, and those days are behind me. Well, I, I got to give you props, man, because you know what? It's very few times we see fighters go out on top. Uh, you had a good record when you left. I mean, it, it's something to be proud of, in my opinion, uh, you know, to go out the way you did. Um, it's better to get out early than to get out late. Uh, in some ways, do you feel like you got out at a good time as well because of the fact that the UFC right now, they've got the Reebok deal. These guys are not getting paid well. Do you feel like, uh, you know, kind of looking at it now, it was kind of like, maybe I made the right choice. Yeah, you know, like I was always fighting on the undercards and some European shit. So there was no real opportunity. You know, when you fight in the UFC on the undercard, you're fighting at like 3.30 in the afternoon. You know, there's like hardly anybody in the stands. You're, there was no fight pass at the time. So it was a real, you know, I never had much luck with sponsorship anyways. So financially, you know, that, that was a wash. But um, I feel like I got out the right time, honestly, because all the athletes are there now. You know, like I, I had, you know, a decent amount of skills because um, I've been training since I was like 15. So 
I was able to sneak out like a lot of like submission wins and stuff. Uh, whereas now everybody, I feel like the talent pool is so deep now that maybe it would be harder for a guy like myself to to have a decent record like I had, you know. So I'm I'm happy that I got in it when I did and I got to see the sport grow. And uh, you know, I'm 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 pleased with it with everything. I, you know, obviously wish I could have won them all, but uh, that that you know that's everybody. Let's talk about your gym. Uh, what what actually made you decide to start your own gym? Honestly, man, um, I was I was training at another gym, and uh, uh, I just wanted more out of you know like the training facility and environment, you know. And and uh, so me and my uh, my first coach decided to open our own gym in two thousand six. And at that time, I had a corporate job. I was working downtown, and um, I mortgaged my house uh, for my half of the you know the uh, the capital. And, uh, it was just, I just wanted a better environment. I wanted to do it my way. And then my, you know, my partner kicked butt at the gym and, and it was like less than a year after we opened it that I was able to quit my job and just do martial arts full time. So, um, yeah, it, it started, it was really just, you know, I just wanted to do it my way. Right. Like, like the uh, Frank Sinatra says, right. got to do it my way. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right now though, it's the biggest gym in Arkansas. Uh, what would you say the biggest reason for its uh, success and its growth? Um, well, we were we were very lucky that um, the Ultimate Fighter started to, to take off, you know, around 2006 when we opened the gym. So that that was fortunate. But also, a lot of people were dabbling in MMA and they were dabbling in jiu-jitsu, but they weren't all in, you know. And uh, they still were, like, making most of their money from their traditional martial arts, where we were the first gym to really just say, you know, we weren't going to do any traditional martial arts. It was going to be jiu-jitsu and, like, kickboxing and MMA. So we jumped in with both feet, and it showed. And, um, you know, we ended up in, like, we kept reinvesting in the facility. We got a bigger facility and we bought the ring, we bought the cage, you know, had the nice tatamis. And, uh, so I think just, you know, having that real authentic passion for it, you know, that just stuck. And then we were fortunate that, you know, the sport grew. So we were the ones that kind of stood out from everybody else because it wasn't like jujitsu, kickboxing, taekwondo, tai chi, well, you know, like all this other stuff that are like red flag. I'm at a gym like you know that's not normally not what you're looking for you produce some fighters that have gone on to the UFC Bellator and the Ultimate Fighter who are some of the people that have gone through your gym and have gone on to success um, yeah uh, Mike Wessel you know he fought uh, last minute replacement against uh, uh, Hardonk and uh, man really you know did a good job in that fight um, especially like last minute um, and then he was on the Ultimate Fighter we had uh, Joe Merritt who started with us and then uh, ended up going to L.A., and he, he ended up uh, in, in the UFC. Um, Seth Kleinbeck, who fought for Strike Force, lead XC, he actually got offered a fight um, at like a weight class above where he was fighting for the UFC, but we, we ended up turning that down. And, um, yeah, that's it as far as, uh, um, as the UFC is concerned. We've... Uh, and then, you know, we've had like, you know, Hillary Williams, who's a world champion, uh, black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu come out of the gym as well. So those are like the, the highlights for us. Well, that's great. I mean, it's, it's nice to see that you're, you know, helping these guys out and kind of getting them to the next level. Uh, you know, when you competed in the UFC in 2009 and, and you know, now being sort of uh, taking a back seat and going sort of the coaching route, uh, what would you say the biggest difference between the MMA scene now and the MMA scene then? Um... That's a good question. Well, I think right now we're just getting more and more opportunities for fighters to fight on these, like, what I would call, like, medium to large size shows. You know, you have Legacy, you have Bellator, you have, uh, like, RFA is a decent show, um, Titan, you know. Uh, these are decent shows that are that are on, like, radar, they're on Fight Pass. Uh, and I think it's great to give guys, like, like good mid-level goals, like, get to that show and then beat some tough guys, like, with, with a little bit of spotlight on you. Because when it's like, I just want to make the UFC, I just want to make the UFC, and then you make it and you drop your first fight, or you, you know, or you might even drop two fights, and then it's like, now where are you? Like, you made it, it didn't work out, now you got to fight your way back in. And uh, it, I think, like, rather than just focusing on, like, that one destination, the UFC, uh, I think just trying to become a better fighter and taking these other opportunities that are really oftentimes going to pay the same as the UFC is, um, I think that's like the biggest difference is that like there's a, and I think it's getting better. You know, I think it's like more things are happening like this where, uh, we've got these medium sized shows and, and they're good outlets for fighters instead of them just being all in on like 
this one organization where they have to be with a certain manager or like the only chance they're going to get in is as a last minute replacement. Um, I think that's really great. So that's the big shift that uh, is positive. Do you still watch the ultimate fighter? I never watched it again after I was on it <laughs> and I had, I had enough for six weeks. I, I didn't watch, uh, I didn't watch it again. Well, let me tell you something. You're not alone. A lot of people don't like the ultimate fighter right now. They say it's stale. They say it's sort of run its course. Uh, do you think they should get rid of the show? Because some people are saying that it just, you know, the UFC getting so many people on the roster now, the, the talent pool in a lot of ways is kind of dried up uh, for the guys are getting on the show now. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I don't know what the numbers are, you know, like from a business perspective, if, if the if there's not much squeeze to it, then they don't have to make a lot of juice off of it for it to make sense. You know, they do these like uh, little markets, like uh, like like you have uh, uh, Ultimate Fighter Mexico or whatever, or like so like it helps them kind of get entrenched and get like a populace and like a smaller area like really into the sport and behind certain fighters. So I can still see value on it, even if it's not at that same scale as like Forrest Griffin, Stephen Bonner, you know, or like all the way up into like you know ultimate fighter 10 or something so yeah like you know it's that law of scarcity when there was just a few of them you were dying to see it but now there's a ufc every week like and then there's 20 something ultimate fighters you, you know you just i mean we're at a point now where like that's the ufc yeah and not even go back and rewatch it you know i used to never miss it and then i would miss one but then i'd go back and find a replay now i miss one it's like i'll just look at the results and move on because there's already another right. one on the horizon so, well, a, yeah, a they, lot of, I was going to say a lot of a lot of people sort of feel that way now. You know, it's like they'll, they'll watch the fights. They'll f sort of fast forward through, uh, you know, all the stuff in the house. I think people are kind of tired of it. And, you know, on top of that now, you know, Dana White's got that looking for a fight show. It seems like he's finding new talent there. And, you know, with with the, you know, uh, things like UFC Fight Pass, you know, shows like Titan and, you know, uh, Victory Fighting and things along those lines, the fighters are getting seen worldwide now because they have, you know, new sort of digital media to be able to stream all this stuff. Yeah, that's and that's a more authentic route, you know. Um, I'll be the first to admit that, you know. Even I, I was fortunate enough to get a win in, in the UFC and to get a win on belt in Bellator, but I'll be the first to admit, you know, uh, luck had a lot to do with with me getting to the UFC. There's a lot of fighters out there who, uh, in my opinion, deserve to be there more than I did, and and that and that's true for a lot of people in the UFC. So I do like um, the concept of going to these other shows and 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 you know it's just. Taking the people for what they're they're doing in the cage. Um, of course, I understand personalities and stuff uh, are also what they're looking for. But yeah, you know, I, I think the UFC is really brilliant. Like a lot of people second guess their stuff, but they saturated that market and that helped them corner it for a long time. You know, I mean, like it's kind of like Starbucks. They'll open up two just to put the other place out of business, and then they'll shut the first one down. You know, and uh, so I think that saturation was on purpose on their end, and I think it was brilliant for them for the fans. We lose the buildup. You know, we used to have to wait two months when BJ Penn was fighting somebody. I can't remember who it was, but um, the build, oh, it was Dan Thomas, I think. You know, the buildup for that was so amazing. You know, it was just amazing. You just couldn't wait for it. Or like, you know, when T. Ortiz was fighting and it was like he was fighting, uh, you know, Ken Shamrock, Adamore Matashenko. And you're just like, man, like, how's the wrestling going to match up? And you had to wait so long. And that buildup, you know, it was, it was always better than the fight. The buildup was always better than the fight, but it was fun. And, you know, we yeah. just don't have that. Before I let you go here, Roly, uh, 10 years, great accomplishment, uh, you know, running your gym. Uh, what's sort of been the highlight if there's one moment that could sort of stand out to you that uh, you look back and you say, man, that was uh, really a great moment in the gym's history? Man, you know, like if, if I had to really um, like to, to think of something, it would be more of like a concept, like. So many of the people that we've worked with, um, you know, like Mike Wessel or, or Black Belt World Champion Hillary Williams, um, uh, so many of the athletes that have come up in our gym, I mean, the ones that really put the work in with us, we, we just, it's just so nice because it's, we're all still together, you know, like even though they might be at a, uh, you know, they live in a different city now or they don't train as much as they used to, like more than like any one thing, it's like I like to look back and, and, and see like the relationships that we've built and they're just real relationships because I think, I think that these, there's gyms like me, all, like my gym all over the nation, like the, uh, the hardcore guys out there in Athens, Georgia, the singer brothers and, and other gyms in, in these gyms are creating the talent. Right. And then what happens is they all go to these main gyms like ATT or Jackson's, all these tough guys that were built by these gyms like mine or, 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 or like the singer brothers or whoever. And, um, but 
But those gyms, man, like the people will be there for like two fights and then they move on, you know, and like there's no like real relationships there. It's just like, you know, get me through this next fight. And then like if I find something better, I'll go there. And, and that's fine because it's a selfish, you know, MMA, you have to be looking out for number one. But with the gym, the thing that that really stands out with me the most is just like my students and my old training partners and stuff. Like we're all still close. And I think it's just such a positive thing. And um, that for me, that's the best part of being involved in martial arts 100% more than any of my, my wins or, you know, coaching Hillary to win a black belt and, and, you know, world championship. Like, that's great. But, like, her coaching me in a match at, like, a grappler's quest meant more to me. Like, her on the sidelines, like, coaching her coach. That Those, like, you know, those things are just really important to me. And that's 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 been my favorite thing about the gym to look back on. It's definitely been the relationships. Well, congratulations again, and uh, thanks again for joining me here on the program, Rolly. Really appreciate it. Uh, just remind my audience where they can get a hold of you on social media and give any uh, thank yous or shout outs. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook. You can like my page, and uh, I, I respond to everybody there. Um, I, I ended up really getting into leg locks and uh, started a real niche market there. And uh, I have an app. It's called Legal Leg Locks, and you can find it on tunes or android and uh i also have one that's called illegal leg locks that i just did with uh, a friend of mine vlad kulikov he's a sambo like master sport and sambo and you can find that at dig itsu b-i-g-i-t-s-u.com and uh the apps are doing really well uh, uh the, the the most popular one though is the one that's for brazilian jiu-jitsu because i teach the leg locks in a way that fits the rule set so you don't get disqualified um, so that's been a big deal for me has allowed me to do a lot of seminars and stuff. So if you're into snapping legs, you can check out those uh, instructionals.